ladies and gentlemen, good evening. Uh, my name's Glenn Burgess. I'm the University of Hull's ex uh, dep Deputy Vice-Chancellor. <laughs> <laughs> I, I forget how time moves on. Um, Deputy Vice-Chancellor, it's my great pleasure to uh, welcome you all to the University of Hull and to this, our splendid Middleton Hall, for this evening's uh, event, which is the latest in the series of BP Cultural Vision Lectures that have spread right through and will spread right through this wonderful year of Hull UK City of Culture 2017. The University is very pleased to be able to offer these lectures, which have been a great success throughout the year, uh, in conjunction with BP, who sponsor them, and we're delighted to be able to host them. As you will probably have noticed if you've been to any previous events of these, not all of them live up to the title of being lectures, and this evening is another example of a, of a discussion rather than a lecture. Furthermore, this evening's event differs from other, some of the previous ones in, in another way, in that it is not simply uh, an event in which we hear from people who uh, are significant leaders in the cultural sector. Rather, if we think of tonight, as we perhaps should in a university context, think of tonight as providing an answer to an exam question, the exam question we would have tonight would be a compare and contrast question, because we're hearing from two very prominent figures who are leaders in very different fields, one in the cultural industries and one in BP itself. They will have the opportunity in the course of the evening to tell you something of their careers and their life story, so I'll keep my introductions very brief. You've in any case come to hear them, uh, not me. So we will be hearing tonight in conversation Alex Beard, Chief Executive of the Royal Opera House, where he's, he's been in that role since um, 2013 previously working for a long period of time at the Tate Gallery as Deputy Director since 2002, other roles before that. He's had an association with uh, the Arts Council, Glyndebourne and other uh, organisations as well. Alex Beard, fortunately perhaps given his current role, has a lifelong love of opera and ballet. Uh, accompanying him, talking with him, will be Peter Mather, Who's the uh, head? Of, who was appointed head of country for BP, uh, head of country UK for BP in January 2004, uh, and sort of moving in the opposite direction to the country as a whole. He's expanded from UK to to Europe, and became regional president for Europe in 2010. Uh, he has a long career in BP prior to that, having worked in many different parts of the organisation. They, of course, will be here on stage in just a moment uh, talking about their experiences in and challenges in leading these organisations. And so the compare and contrast uh, question is really about comparing the experience of working in the cultural sector to um, a very different sort of business. Their facilita the facilitator of their discussion, their interlocutor, is probably, is, if anyone deserves to be said to need no introduction in Hull in 2017, it's probably Martin Green. Is there anyone here who doesn't know who Martin Green is? <laughs> Chief... <laughs> 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 well, <laughs> Chief Executive and Artistic Director of Hull, uh, UK City of Culture 2017, a role in which he brings a wealth of experience, having been part of the team that made the Millennium Dome into the very successful O2 Arena, Director of uh, ceremonies at the London Olympics, uh, organiser of the uh, the Tour de France Grand Départ, many other things in a distinguished career. But this year, of course, he's delivered three quarters, three quarters of Hull 2017, perhaps less than three quarters, because I think he also has a role in the setting up the legacy beyond 2017 as well. So Martin will be tonight's facilitator. It's my great pleasure, therefore, to invite our three speakers onto the stage, and I hope you'll join me in welcoming them. Well, good evening, everyone. Thank you very much for joining us. I'm in uh, a very unusual position tonight, which is listening. 
most of the people who work for me because they have any possibility of doing that. Um, I'll get some detail in a minute. I'd just like to start with, some, with some, a couple of local contexts, actually. Uh, Peter, for those of our guests in the audience who don't know, can you, can you talk about BP and Hull for us? Mm, no, absolutely. Well, um, <coughs> we have a, a large petrochemical plant uh, further down the Humber in Salt End, uh, where we employ a little over 350 people. Uh, we've actually been on this site for 50 years this year, and the site has existed actually for 100 years. So it was a kind of deep, deep legacy. And in fact, a lot of, a lot of people around BP have worked at that site, uh, either started there or, or, or cycled through there. So, um, yeah, we're very, very proud to be involved in the whole city of culture for that reason. Great. And we'll talk about the Royal Ballet being here a couple of weeks ago, but uh, can, can, I, I wonder if you could tell people about your love for vinyl and what happened to you the other weekend when you were in Hull. Uh, okay, so I was uh, um, back in Hull for the first time in a long time and, um, with the Royal Ballet, and I uh, found myself uh, uh, with a few minutes to spare, so I wandered into the covered market and discovered Spin It, the most fantastic vinyl shop on the planet. And <laughs> Left um, well over 100 quid poorer and with a very heavy bag. But anyway, it's completely wonderful and particularly wonderful because I managed to track down a copy of uh, a very, very rare pressing of a fall concert that they performed in Preston in 1980 and I was in the audience then. As, um, as a stroppy 17-year-old, so it was, it was just wonderful, wonderful. Day I, I happened to see Alex moments after this purchase had been made, and you've never seen a happier man in your <laughs> life. <laughs> uh, it was extraordinary. So look, um, the vinyl was probably made with products from the BP plant. Unscripted. I thought what we do this evening is sort of demystify some of these roles you have in the arts and big business, talk about what that means and find the co commonality. We are in a city going through change, in a country going through change, uh, in a world going through change, and I think eventually we'll, we'll bring that, that very much around culture. But you know, let's just start with some basics. You two have got some very fancy job titles in some very big businesses. Can you, first of all, and I'll start with Peter, kind of give us a bit of a backstory about that journey there and, and then tell us what being the group VP of Europe means? <laughs> well, I mean, I'm quite unusual in VP because I actually have an arts degree. Um, so most of my colleagues, the majority of my colleagues are engineers or chemists or um, have some sort of scientific background. <coughs> but I actually have a degree in modern languages, which at the time was very traditional and lots of Goethe and Moliere and all that, but not much practical. Um, so I joined VP on the commercial side of the business uh, and have actually worked around all kinds of different parts of the company, whether it's the, what we call the downstream or the upstream or the midstream. It all has stream on the end, as you can <laughs> see. Um, and um, uh, really, I think because I'd worked in so many different parts of the company, the natural gas business and the, the oil business and the upstream business, um, it, it seemed quite a logical move for me to try and take on a role that brought it all together, which is really what, what the role I'm doing now is, which is trying to provide the consistency and the coherence and the overview of everything that we do in the UK and Europe. And by the way, for BP, the UK is part of Europe, just to be quite clear. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm going to get to that later, <laughs> <laughs> no doubt. By the way, I should say that we're going to have a bit of a chat and then, as usual, we're going to throw it out uh, for your own questions. So, so that... I mean, I sit there and look at a title called Group Vice President of Europe and think I, I have no concept of how that geographical spread can be possibly managed by one person. Can you give us a bit of an insight into how that works? Well, the answer, of course, is it's not managed by one person. Um, <coughs> we, we have a kind of matrix structure, which sounds a little bit technical. I don't want to get into business school speak, but we have a sort of matrix structure with the line accountabilities, the performance units, and then we have uh, different functions going across. And I sort of sit above the matrix and try and make sure the matrix works. So uh, a, a lot of it's about having yellow cards and red cards in my pocket. So if something isn't quite right, you know, I can show the card. A lot of it's about helping, like my colleagues here who run the, the site when there are issues, whether there are issues to do with uh, employer relations or government relations or, mm. you know, uh, external external issues. Um, and, and I get to chair a lot of internal boards, which uh, means I spend my whole time signing things. But uh, it's a lot of fun. I mean, it's a, 
it's a fantastic um, privilege, actually, to kind of have that, uh, that oversight, because it really is from everything from what we're doing in sort of the renewable sector through to the traditional <coughs> businesses in the North Sea and, uh, and, and plants like here. So it's, uh, it's very exciting. Okay. Alex, Chief Executive of the Royal Opera House, one of, if not the greatest arts institutions in the world. Um, tell us a bit about your journey towards that. Well, it was a slightly, um, <coughs> it was a slightly convoluted one in that I come from a very medical family. I was determined from a very young age that medicine wasn't for me. And so I um, tried to make it as difficult as possible to become a doctor. So I read classics with a little bit of Sanskrit to start off with. And then I um, went, my father died when I was quite young. I um, sort of, in a mild way, went off the rails. What my mother describes as the last, uh, the lost decade. I describe it, uh, it's only six years, but she says it felt like 20. At the end of that, um, I had sort of bombed out of accountancy for 10 months. I'd done a string of dead-end temp jobs, and I found myself, um, just by pure fluke, working in the Arts Council as a glorified filing clerk. And for the first time, uh, what I was working at, what I believed in, uh, and my values came together in one place. And I started to work quite hard at it. And the Arts Council is a... A wonderful institution, deeply flawed, much better than any alternative to it. And it goes through about every 12 to 15 months a massive restructuring. <laughs> and, and through, I was very fortunate, through each of those massive restructurings, I found myself with a different uh, uh, and slightly larger role, uh, uh, one of which was to be the secretary of a commission of inquiry into the Royal Opera House in 1991. And it was through that that I met uh, someone called Dennis Stevenson, who was then chairman of uh, uh, Pearson and also chairman of the Tate. And he said that it was ridiculous that I'd been working at the Arts Council four or five years and I needed to get a proper job and do something. And I thought, well, actually, he's not wrong. So I got um, what was then my dream job, which was to be Administrative Director of Scottish Opera Finance Administration. Uh, but I fell in love. And I fell in love with someone whose life journey was from rural Northumberland to West London. And there was no way she was reversing at the M1 to be an opera widow in Glasgow. <laughs> so um, I was despairing. I didn't know what to do, and before I made the wrong decision, I got a call from Headhunters uh, from the Tate. And I thought, well, you know, it's not uh, music theatre, uh, but I've heard this Nick wrote is an interesting guy. They've got these thoughts for a gallery of modern art, and um, it's in London. And um, so I chucked my hat in the ring and said no to the Scottish Opera uh, team, and was very, very lucky that I ended up getting that job and had an extraordinary... Uh, journey there for um, just shy of 20 years in a number of different roles, but all the time thinking that if something popped up in the world of music, theatre and opera, that I'd go for it, and specifically if it happened to be at Covent Garden, that would just be amazing. And so when Tony Hall left, I didn't wait for headhunters to make a call, I battered the door down and said, I want this job, I want this job. And again, I was very, very fortunate after you know, rounds of interviews to um, be invited to join, and that's what I've been doing for the last five years. That's going to be me if we ever win Eurovision. <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> now, you went, you saw, I mean, you saw through, I mean, this is under, you, you saw Tate through the opening of Tate Modern, yeah. and also the switch house, the, the, the ground had been broken, everything was up while you were there. I mean, fantastic, enormous projects. Did you ever have did you ever find issues with people's vision of what you were doing, i.e. that, you know, was the vision limitless? Did you feel you had to push the penny all the time? We absolutely had to push it. I mean, no one asked us to um, create Tate Modern. And, um, you know, it was only uh, a third of the money came from public sources. The rest of it we had to get out and raise. And that vision came really from Nick, uh, Nick Sorota, an absolutely extraordinary man. Uh, who, when he was appointed to be director of the Tate, wrote this two-side, well, actually one-side uh, piece of paper called Grasping the Nettles, and in it he described all of the things that a national institution of modern art should strive, a national, uh, 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 the Tate Gallery should try, strive to do as a national gallery of modern art, in particular to um, create a dedicated modern art museum in London. And, um, and so... You know, the journey was really thinking about what that meant at the end of the 20th century, what it meant in London, and how to do it on a, on a scale that would uh, help to reframe the discussion around contemporary art. And um, it was a heck of a journey. We had some uh, very um, had some wonderful moments along the way, but also some pretty 
um, scary man. What's your relationship there with the with the director of tape, the artistic lead, if you like, and, and as we journey towards you know understanding how this works in arts or institutions? Well, I'm the curator, so um, the you know uh, 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 the vision for how the um, work should be presented, the um, curatorial construct, the collecting policy, that's all you know, very much on the artistic side. My job was to find a way of making it happen and to do so uh, in a way that uh, would um, bring the, resource, the necessary resources in. Uh, because when I joined the Tate, um, it was an institution of 330 people that got 90% of it, just under 90% of its money in one check from government. And by the time we opened uh, Tate Modern, it was an institution of around about 1,000 people that got uh, under 40% of its money from government. And so um, trying to find ways of uh, and bringing that vision uh, to life um, through um, a, a partnership, through infusing philanthropists, through um, creating a, a really wonderful bookshop for publishing things, all, all of that side mm. of it. But you're not a, you know, some of those positions are occupied by lawyers or people yep. who came through finance. You came through a cultural pathway. So you have a view of art, oh. and, and does no, that look, help, look. hindrance, you have an opinion? No, I think it's absolutely vital to be connected to it. I mean, I am deeply, deeply passionate about um, the arts. And uh, my mum was a, f uh, although I come from a medical family, my mum was a flute teacher. I learned an instrument when I was young. I was an incredibly bad sketcher. I wrote, wrote doggerel poetry. And the arts have been incredibly important for me as a point of <coughs> connection and reflection. And I, I, I believe that they are hugely, hugely important. So, um, you know, that mission of... Um, taking the arts to as wide an audience as possible and doing it in a way that um, tries to break down some of the perceived barriers to engaging with the arts is, is absolutely you know, mission central for me. And Peter, I mean, obviously you said you, you came from a rather different background to many of your colleagues. Have you, is there a way you can characterise what difference you feel that has made to the way you do your job or the approach you take to your job? I have to say, it's quite interesting. I hadn't worked. I also come from a very deeply medical family. Okay. Um, in fact, my parents were both medical students at King's in London, and their first date was Madame Butterfly at the Royal Opera House. So, um, <laughs> a, a, a slightly something we don't talk about so much in the family is my grandfather spent his 21st birthday in Bow Street Jail, just opposite Covent Garden. <laughs> but that, 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 that's another story. <laughs> um, sorry, your question. Yeah. Um, I, I, I actually think, uh, you know, although BP is a sort of a highly sort of technical, technological, sort of engineering driven type organisation, if it was just run by engineers, and there are a couple of my colleagues in the room who are engineers, I think it probably wouldn't work as well. Because yes, you need to engineer everything, it needs to be well plumbed, but you need to be able to also think mm slightly differently at times. Um, We're talking about creativity, basically, yeah. aren't we? Well, uh, I would never be as presumptuous to say that I'm more creative than, than, than an engineer, because I, I, you know, I think it's... But I think having diversity of background, diversity of opinion, um, is really, really important in a large organisation, because, um, I mean, what, so somebody of my background might go down uh, the wrong route, but, but in, you know, engineers, if things aren't absolutely perfect, it, there's a problem. Um, so, uh, and they love solving solutions and can do do that really well. But the sort of the blend of the uh, of the sort of the, the slightly different angle on life with the very very clear kind of engineering approach to problems that is actually a, I think you know a very strong combination if you can pull it off. And Alex, you actually so you get your dream job. You get you get to the opera house where you really you know you have a profound love of ballet and opera. Yeah. What, how characteristically has that changed what you do in, in, the opera, in, in the Opera House now, or is the fundamentals of the job the same, coming over well, from Tate? Well, um, no, it, it's very different being number one to number two. Um, I mean, you are ultimately accountable for the whole thing. If anything goes wrong, it's your fault. Um, the, um, but, but there are some basic similarities. I mean, both the Tate and the Royal Opera House create a platform for the world's most extraordinary artist to create life-changing experiences without quite enough money. And you know, so, you know, sustaining that, um, you know, keeping, ensuring that you've got the right people around you who can have you know, the right eye for artists who can create those life-changing experiences and you know, finding ways to garner enthusiasm, passion and support amongst the audience, the supporter base, to bring that to life is, those, 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 are, those, those are absolute commonalities. I mean, at the Opera House, 
I mean, I, I, I mean, I, 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 there's something about um, you know, extreme lyric theatre, and I think ballet and opera are extreme lyric theatre, where you've got 300 people coming together in the moment, roughly 100 people on stage, roughly 100 people in the pit, 50 people back of house, 50 people front of house, to do something which is pretty well impossible, and to make those people in the audience different people when they leave to when they come in is just extraordinary. So... Um, uh, 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 I'm, I am just absolutely passionate that as many people as possible should be able to engage with that. Mm. I mean, so you know, the very fact that you know, last night we had um, a brilliant performance of Love RM in uh, the Opera House in Covent Garden with 2,256 uh, bums on seats, rapturous applause, but also north of 30,000 people around the country in cinemas sharing in that moment and 40 other countries across uh, the world. It was just amazing. And that, um, uh, and, and I guess that's uh, a mission to open up access to these extraordinary art forms is at the heart of um, our story. Because you've got, you, you got two of the, the biggies when it comes to uh, conversation points about the arts. What you make is very, very expensive and needs high levels of funding, and you're in London. Um, yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, as I said, you know, 300 people coming together to do something is in and of itself uh, um, uh, uh, very expensive, and it's doing, it and, and that's performing for 2,000 people. It's sort of the antithesis of stadium rock, where you've got, you know, 50 people coming together to perform for 20,000. It's, it's a totally different gig. But the wonderful thing about um, uh, uh, new technology um, and broadcast media, live cinema relays, big screens, which we do with BP, is that we're now able to share that live experience with many, many more, uh, uh, um, point one. Point two is that um, with the support of the Arts Council, with the support of philanthropists, we can create um, all sorts of new ways into that, that art form. So we, we have a series of welcome performances where uh, uh, the top price ticket is around about 20, 25 quid, and you can only buy a ticket if you've never been to Covent Garden before. Uh, we have a student scheme where at the end of last year we had 22,000 student members who have access to um, special performances where the whole house is devoted to a student audience uh, and, and so on. So, so, so to that extent, we're trying to break through the, uh, um, the, the, you know, the barriers of the four walls and the limits of 2,300 uh, seats. But the other is to play a role as a national institution. So you know, a couple of weeks ago, to be part of City of Culture, to be um, part of the extraordinary moment of reopening the Hull New Theatre and doing that with you know, extraordinary talents from Hull, but also the very, very greatest ballet dancers on the planet, with 3,500 people in Queen's Gardens uh, and that master stroke of an 18-minute delay on the second half. So as the curtain went down, the stars could appear on stage and the whole place erupted. It was just magical. And finding those moments where we can be part of that larger conversation and doing so in a way that uh, um, you know, connects to the extraordinary things, Martin, that you've achieved and that everyone in this room has achieved here mm. over the last year. It's just brilliant. Now, Peter, you, you know, BP has a very long history of working with culture and supporting the arts. Why? Hmm. Um, <clears throat> it's something that is, has been in our DNA, as you say, for about 50 years. So our, our very early sponsorship of the arts dates, dates back that far. Um, it's something we've always felt was the right thing to do. It's something we've always felt was something our employees wanted us to do. Um, and it sounds a bit, kind of, I don't want to sound self-righteous, but you know, it is a way of putting something back into society. Uh, and companies have different ways of doing that. I'm not saying we're the only company that does that. Everybody does it slightly differently. Um, but we know we haven't sponsored a football team, for example. We, we've just felt um, for 50 years now that putting something back into our communities via the arts um, w was the right thing to do. Now, um, <coughs> we also do other things as well, obviously education and you know, particularly science, technology, engineering and maths and social enterprise activities, so it's not, it's not just the arts. Um, but we've also found you know, a, a, a very comfortable place working with fantastic institutions you know, like, like, like the Royal Opera House. So, um, I mean, we've been working with the Royal Opera House now for getting on for 30 years. Um, and uh, so we've, we've always believed that having long-lasting, enduring partnerships was the way to go, rather than just breezing in 
sponsoring a glitzy exhibition and then breezing out. Mm -hmm. So it's a long-term commitment. Uh, I mean, we're a long-term business. I mean, it takes often 10 to 15 years from when you discover uh, a gas field to actually producing it. Mm. Um, so we're in the business of long-term partnerships, and the arts is just one example and of that. And of course, it's not without controversy, is it? Uh, no. BP's involvement with the arts and what BP does. So you know, I expect this will come up a bit later as well. But you know, wh what's your immediate answer to to the controversy that surrounds BP's involvement uh, with the arts? Well, I mean, I'm very proud of, of what we do. Um, we do it for very, very clear reasons. We do it because our employers want us to do it. We, we do it because it's, it's our little way of giving a little bit back to, to society. We do genuinely believe that you know, a healthy society is a better place to do business. We don't want to do business you know, in, in unhealthy, culturally barren environments. So you know, f sponsoring the whole city of culture was an absolute you know, brilliant thing for us to get involved with because it, it's just so important for the and, city. And we're in an environment now, you know, where we're seeing the effect culture can have on cities and the places mm. we live. I mean, I, I really, if nothing else out of this year, I want us to mm. become the poster boy for, you know, sadly making the argument again that it is fundamental. So, I mean, Alex, I presume you believe this too, but where, where do you see it in the work of the Opera House and the ballet and, and the connection you're making with the kind of challenges that face us today? Well, the importance of culture. Mm. Well, I think it's absolutely fundamental. I mean, it's through culture <coughs> that uh, we reflect on what it is to live. Um, you know, the, in the shared space of cultural discourse, whether that is an outdoor art exhibition or... Um, you know, an, an extraordinary resting piece of music theatre is where we have the moment to examine um, you know, the limits and possibilities of humanity. I think it's just, it's just absolutely fundamental. And uh, whether that, uh, and that is, that is and should be a shared space. And we're going back to the sort of notion of opening up. Um, now, opera and ballet started off as closed courtly entertainments 450 years ago for an invited audience and over the last 400 years have gradually opened up into the life of uh, um, you know, the cities with the, the emergence of you know, uh, grand theatres, uh, in mostly in city centres all around Europe now in Far East states, South America. Um, now culture is in uh, the ether and culture has always had an extraordinarily important role in placemaking. You think about you know, the British Museum and its role in reclaiming the rookeries of St Giles from you know, the, uh, the, the footpaths, the role of the National Gallery in London and, uh, you know, the creation of Trafalgar Square, the, you know, uh, and the capital's um, town square, um, through to, uh, you know, what's been achieved here over the last year. Uh, um, it, it, I think uh, culture is a fundamentally important uh, um, means of reflection and exchange about what it is to live. If we know this to be true, why doesn't everybody else? Why don't some policy makers not know this? Why is it not fundamental to our education scheme and, and, uh, it's, and a system? And, and to put that in a positive sense, I want to put it positively, where are we getting potentially the argument wrong or how could we make the argument better about its fundamental importance? Um, it's a really difficult one, that, because I actually don't know the answer. Um, because uh, if you look at what's going on in, um, in education, uh, there's absolutely no doubt that the amount of space for structured cultural engagement is shrinking in the state sector at precisely the time when every single independent school's brochure boasts about how broad the cultural mm. education is and the range of cultural opportunities. And I, for one, think that is a desperate, desperate shame. Um, I, think, um, I, th I think that there is an understanding um, amongst policy makers in the, genera in the generality that um, the arts, creative self-expression, um, culture, the ability of a citizen, citizen to apply creative intelligence to problems and the role that um, creati uh, participating in creativity, uh, uh, the, the role that that plays in that, I think that is understood. Uh, but at the moment it's not backed up with sufficient action. 
And um, I think it's ironic, another ir irony is that just as uh, that, uh, uh, that squeeze is happening, um, not, not everywhere, and there, there are some wonderful examples of great achievement, but, uh, but it is happening in, in some places, um, that uh, the education sector, for example, in Singapore, which was absolutely focused on uh, uh, um, so-called STEM subjects, is trying to bake in creativity and cultural self-expression into its education system. Um, and uh, if you look at the, you know, the best educational outcomes uh, in Europe, Finland stands out by a, 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 a mile, and um, their um, culture is compulsory part of the education uh, um, syllabus through to the age of 16. Um, now, um, so I think I, I, I th I, that that's really just a call for action from me. Um, uh, what can we do about it? There is something I, th I think actually that we can do as institutions. Um, and you've shown over the last year, you've all shown over the last year through what you've achieved here, that the place that culture can have in placemaking. And I think as an example for other cities, and it's just fantastic that's coming through in the theme of the legacy. And I think that we as uh, um, institutions, whether that's as, um, a, a, a sponsors or, 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 or as arts organisations, we can do our bit. So um, getting... Um, uh, you know, the very high quality culture out into the public realm through the big screens is a fantastic thing to do. It uh, allows people to uh, um, you know, engage with the arts for the first time without that sort of price barrier and so on. Um, what we're doing in terms of trying to work with um, schools across the country with uh, national learning projects around cr um, creati creativity and singing and creativity and dance, uh, you know, there, there, there are things that we can do. But I, but I do think that... Um, you know, there's more that the system itself needs to do because, uh, you know, what um, makes life uh, worth living is, I think, um, you know, uh, our humanity. Mm. And what uh, explores and gives expression to that is culture and creativity. So, um, you know, it's absolutely Can I try a big, a big point on you, <coughs> which might backfire? I mean, what, one of the things that um, we are seeing in the world at the moment is possibly a slight turning away from electorates from pure economics, from pure mm. money. Uh, you've seen that in some of the referendums, some of the recent elections. And I, I don't know, I mean, I, I, I just wonder whether actually, you know, there is going to be a slight change in, in the thinking of politicians that actually maybe it's not all about, um, you know, the bottom line, the GDP and all the rest of it. Maybe there is something else called culture that actually is what people are craving and want more of. So. I, I just think we are maybe at a slightly interesting time when these things might be shifting a little bit. I hope so. Yeah, I, th I, I, I think that's... I, I, I seriously hope so. And I, and I, and I definitely feel that um, that is there uh, increasingly rhetorically in how um, culture is being spoken about. And uh, I think things like the Durham Commission, which the Arts Council has announced around mm. uh, you know, culture and education, uh, and how that has been enthusiastically received by um, the, the government. I think that, you know, that's, that, that's all to the good. But I do think that um, actually the space for um, the arts in uh, education is, is of fundamental importance and, uh, and more needs to be done on that front. And of course, if we look to the future as well and, and speak about change, we, we have Brexit on the horizon, whether we like it or not. Um, as a businessman running a business, What's your view of Brexit? Oh, gosh. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, I uh, will put aside my personal view. Um, for a company like BP that was a pro-Remain company, and that's my personal position as well, but uh, um, we, we, uh, it's not the biggest single issue facing us, if I'm totally honest. Um, as I say, we would have preferred Britain to stay in the European Union because we think that the uh, uncertainty that it's all provoking is not good for, for, for anyone. Um, for BP ourselves, actually, we, you know, we're a global business. We're in nearly 80 countries, um, and oil and gas and, and energy tends to move tariff-free around the world, so we're not suddenly going to find we can't move things from, from A to B. Um, I mean, personally, I worry a little bit about, I mean, I hope this is all not right, um, but I do worry a little bit about sort of a diminished role for, 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 for the UK. Um, I hope not. Um, 
I, I'm pleased to see, I mean, we were very much uh, in favour of Scotland remaining part of the United Kingdom, and uh, mm. so we, we, you know, I, we hope that the, the Brexit vote doesn't sort of re reopen sores uh, in that area. Um, we also employ uh, well over a thousand uh, EU 27, not non UK EU nationals uh, in the UK, uh, and a slightly smaller number, but a significant number of. British people on the continent. We do. We don't want them to feel any insecurity. We want people to be able to to stay working where they want to work. We want to be able to move to move talent around. Um, and the City of London is home to um, about forty percent of our shareholders. Uh, it's where we raise all our debt. It's where we trade uh, a lot of our derivatives and things. And we'd like the City of London mm. as well to remain. Um, a significant place in the world. Alex, it seems to me, and I think I was as guilty of this as anyone else, that 99% of the arts and people who worked in it have really only recently lifted their heads up from their despair and their crying and their mourning to say, what are we going to do about this? And do you have some thoughts about how a, a culture and Brexit could find a partnership? Oh, I don't know. Um, well, just echo some of the things that Peter said. So, so, so actually, uh, um, my first priority is um, uh, uh, actually to think about the people who work with us. So um, uh, we have um, a, uh, like many other uh, 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 central London uh, service businesses and uh, enterprises, we have a, a, a large number of EU nationals who uh, work with us and have done for years. Um, I think it's something, front of house, it's something like 40%. Um, EU 27 um, uh, uh, membership, and, and they're m amazing people. And so ensuring that they're well looked after, and uh, that's priority number one. Priority number two is that uh, for art forms, the ballet and opera, that draw the world's best talent to our stages, uh, much of which is European, that we can continue to do so relatively easily so that we can enrich the lives of people across the country. That is uh, um, uh, priority number two. Um, and, um, and I think th third is that uh, um, through this process that our cultural horizons don't shrink. Uh, I think that's the key thing, is that um, you know, the, uh, um, you know, the, the, the arts um, uh, go beyond national boundaries. And that you know, if I just think about you know, last night, I mentioned La Boheme. So we've got um, an uh, Italian-American heritage Brit conducting an orchestra of 11 different nationalities with, uh, in the lead roles, um, an American, an Australian, a Pole. Now, clearly, that's beyond Brexit, but, 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 but should any of those, uh, um, God forbid, you know, fall sick and we need to pull someone in at short notice, to be able to do that without, um, uh, um, you know, you know, without too much pedophobia is key. But, but more fundamentally, that we can continue to have that um, uh, uh, an exp expanded view about what it is that unites us as, uh, uh, as um, people. Mm. And um, you know, uh, humanity, uh, um, the, the human condition, what it is to love, what it is to lose, what it is, you know, in a very rich sense, to live, that, that's transnational. And, and, and so anyway, I hope that uh, our response to um, the uh, um, risks uh, and, and challenges ahead um, will be to act expansively and um, with uh, creative ambition. Um, yeah. Interesting. Right. I'm going to throw it over to the audience uh, and just prepare for that by segue. Um, what's the last best thing you saw? The last best thing I saw. I well, in in the cultural space. Yep. I'll tell you. I'll tell you what it is. It, it, it's, a, it's actually on the frontier between culture and um, gymnastics. So, uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> excellent. And it really was Saturday afternoon. The Spellthorn Gymnastics Club, um, who have actually had some help from the Royal Ballet, um, did at, at a at a uh, an event, a uh, private event, did a gymnastics version of uh, a little bit of Swan Lake, um, and I forget who it was at the Royal Opera House had helped choreograph it. And it, these are kind of kids from ten to sort of sixteen. And it was the most on towers, sort of four yeah, people. I'm sure high. It, was David, yeah. it was the most extraordinary thing 
I'd ever seen. Excellent. And it was just a privilege. Alex? I'm too much of a magpie to pick one thing. So, <laughs> um, uh, uh, I mean, just, just, just three. I mean, we just opened an exhibition in partnership with the V&A, which looks at, I'm talking about Brexit, looks at the um, history of Europe as seen through the lens of opera. Um, wonderful moment to be doing it. Um, seven cities over four centuries. And, uh, and how that, um, in, in uh, a completely different space, has been able to bring some of the uh, magic of theatre and the history of the art form to life uh, uh, was properly inspiring. Um, and we were sort of bit players in that, so that was definitely a credit to the V&A. Uh, second thing was um, to see uh, Akram Khan's Giselle uh, come back to the stage of Sadler's Wells English National Ballet. Um, uh, it's, it's team ballet, a wonderful piece. Uh, second time round, uh, uh, just a, a, a brilliant counterpoint to that uh, 19th century classic. And then closer to home, uh, we have a young artist program, and this week is Meet the Young Artist Week. And uh, on Monday, lun lunchtime, we had a recital with uh, the newest intake of young artists in St. Clemens Danes Church on the Strand, um, uh, uh, giving uh, 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 an audience of about 300 people a taste of their expertise. And it was just amazing to see what brilliant talent is coming through. And, and in particular, there's this two... Uh, two, uh, um, ha uh, uh, four hands, two people, uh, one piano uh, version of the overture from Meistersinger that was just extraordinary. How that piano survived, I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so that's, the, so that, that, that's this week's three. Excellent. <laughs> right, so who has a question for our two esteemed guests? Right, so I'll take that lady over here and I'll take this gentleman here. It, it is a point, you know, that uh, our friend there is not the only person to say that this city and cities like it are starved of culture and we have metropolises in, this, in, the, in the UK that are not. Where, how do you think we continue to journey to a better balance here? Well, I, my view is that it's not either or, it's both and. And that um, now the example of what you've achieved over this year is something which needs to be sustained. And you know, the uh, a wonderful, uh, wonderful experience that uh, um, we had the other week at the Home New Theatre is something that we need to sustain, um, uh, you know, year, year in, year out. And it's inspired us to say, well, look, we should do one, uh, you know, similar high-profile event on top of you know, whatever we do with you know, big screens and, and relays and national education. Um, but I, I definitely don't think it's either or. I think that. Um, you know, it is precisely examples like this last year and uh, the, the, the uh, um, talent and the, the, the equity in the great national institutions that needs to be built upon, um, not diminished. Uh, and I think that, um, uh, and therefore I'm, I'm very excited by you know, the announcement around legacy, that um, I think there's a great chance of doing that. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'd get my soapbox a minute there. I'd, I'd Nobody asks that London should have less education provision or health provision so the rest of the country has more, can have more. And I don't know why people ask it to have less arts provision so the rest can have more. It, it, it has got to be an as well as conversation, yeah. uh, I feel. Yeah, uh, sir, we said we'd come to you. Uh, Alex, before the Paris Climate Conference, uh, you signed a letter with many others from the culture sector um, calling on world leaders um, to tackle climate change. Yep. Um, and now there is a target in place to limit uh, temperature increases by 1.5 uh, degrees. Um, if we're going to achieve that goal and stop cities uh, like Paris from flooding over the next few decades, um, we can't be uh, drilling for new sources of fossil fuels uh, like we, we are currently doing. And so given this difference in visions about the future of our city and our planet, uh, do you feel it's time for you to re-evaluate your partnership uh, with your sponsor? 
So I think just before there were some people up there, because that microphone's not working now, friends in the box. There's a question about climate change and uh, a letter Alex sent and the role of BP in that. Well, look, um, uh, the Opera House, like many um, uh, uh, businesses in all sorts of different um, sectors and many other cultural organisations, uh, has been working really hard to reduce our uh, carbon footprint and our carbon emissions. And in fact, we've just uh, received a uh, four-star um, good rating from Julie's Bicycle for some of the work that we've done. So um, I, I think that uh, and commitment to use our resources sustainably and to think about the long-term impact of our work is uh, absolutely uh, uh, undiminished. Um, and I think that's completely separate from uh, actually what our partnership is about. I mean, our partnership is about um, using uh, um, our um, shared values and to use the resources that BP can uh, bring to us to find ways of uh, bringing our culture into the public sphere and to inspire audiences to have their first taste of it for many of them. And actually, I don't think those two things are in conflict. And I, we've never had a conversation uh, ever where, um, you know, you've suggested that, what, that, that our environmental um, um, actions should in any way be uh, um, limited, nor, have, nor for that matter... Our, 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 our artistic horizon is limited. In fact, it's very much been a case of uh, um, mutual uh, respect and trust and allowing us to do things that we simply otherwise wouldn't do in terms of extending um, cultural access. And going to the fundamentals of the Opera House, you know, we get um, now uh, around about 20% of our income from subsidy um, from the Arts Council. Um, and, and, and we live in a mixed economy. We simply couldn't do remotely what we do without uh, uh, um, significant box office revenue, significant uh, um, sponsorship, uh, and significant philanthropy. And I think that's that uh, mixed economy of which BP is a super important part that enables us to do what we do um, confidently. A debate that will continue. Let's uh, take another question. Uh, we'll go to the lady in the back on the right. May I continue a bit this, uh, this question? Don't you think it's a bit ironic to talk about um, the future, the legacy of City of Culture in a place which is actually one of the two cities in, in UK which will be the first to be flooded by, uh, as an effect of uh, the rise of the, the oceans, which is due to the um, to burning of, uh, of the fuse, uh, fossil fuels, and uh, these fossil fuels are actually uh, in 1.53% um, a product of BP activity uh, since 30 years. Um, I'm happy to take this conversation outside, but I know we have a lot of people with a lot of different conversations, so I just want to change the but subject onto something else, but thank you very much for bringing that up. Is there someone who wants to talk about, to raise a different question to another subject while we've got these two people in the room? who is going to ask a different question on a different subject. That's the deal. Lady in the blue top. Um, thank you. When I was at school, I went to two opera performances, and the first one was a performance at the Royal Opera House, and it was how I imagined opera would be like, a performance of Madame Butterfly. And then I went to another performance, which was a performance of Peter Grimes, and I was hooked. It was fantastic. So I've noticed over the last few years there's been a lot of development at the Royal Opera House to make it more accessible for more people to experience opera. But my passion is the more modern operas and the ones which as yet, much to my frustration, are not available on the cinema screens and things like that. So what I would like to know is how do you, at the Royal Opera House, intend to make that type of opera more accessible to more people, especially young people who may never have experienced it? Okay. Um, well, uh, um, I'm really pleased that um, we can do quite a lot through um, streaming. So uh, picking that sort of obscure 20th century um, strand, Paul Roger by Szymanowski, I don't know if you managed to catch it on the opera platform, but... Doesn't get much more obscure than that. I'm a Szymanowski nut, but we're in a very small minority. <laughs> uh, 
And it was completely on brilliant. Vinyl. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And it was completely brilliant to be able to have that for six months, um, free to access through the uh, um, EU funded uh, opera platform. Um, I think uh, we, we, we've made a, uh, an institution, a, 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 a big commitment to new commissions. So just if you look forward to the next year, two things for you to look at, which you will, I'm sure, absolutely adore. One is Coraline, um, which is uh, Neil Gaiman's uh, um, book, for, uh, um, kids' book, which is being brought to life by uh, uh, Mark Anthony Turnage in a, in, a, in, a, in a world premiere that goes to the Barbican um, this March. And that's going to be there for an extended run. Um, so hopefully we can uh, uh, um, attract a very uh, uh, broad new audience. And then the other is uh, uh, George Benjamin, um, possibly the uh, greatest living composer of opera, also happens to be a Brit. Um, his follow-up to Written on Skin a couple of years ago, uh, which has been released in DVD, and uh, we're also hoping to stream uh, Lessons in Love and Violence. That opens next spring too. So, um, uh, um, uh, uh, um, uh, you know, the cinema... I think, uh, is brilliant at bringing to a broad audience um, stuff that is pieces that are, uh, have a broad appeal. It's less good at those specific, um, uh, um, uh, more niche, uh, newer works. But hopefully, by us uh, committing to bringing more of them to the stage, to investing in those new commissions, when we do so, to putting them on at accessible um, prices and to working with partners like the Barbican so we can bring them to a wider audience for an extended run, that those pieces will then have a life that will then enter the repertory and so on and so forth. Um, Is th there a danger that cinema screenings are a get-out clause for national institutions that really should be touring? I think it's, uh, well, I think they're two different things. So um, there are national institutions that tour. They're absolutely wonderful touring companies. There's Welsh National Opera, there's Glanbourne Touring Opera, there's Opera North. They're set up to do it, and they do it brilliantly. And I don't think we should be uh, anything other than wonderfully celebratory about the work that they bring to stages all across the country. And I think that uh, we as the uh, uh, Opera House, we, we work in that ecology. We should um, support them and, um, uh, 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 and enable them to... Uh, uh, work at the very highest level they can. And so an example of that is uh, uh, ballet, just com coming up in a couple of weeks, uh, that we have a festival uh, celebrating Kenneth McMillan, one of the towering geniuses of the 20th century, towering artistic geniuses, who is a brilliant choreographer. And we've invited all of the um, touring companies from the UK to perform a one-act Kenneth McMillan ballet uh, in Covent Garden as part of a celebration of his work. And then they get four free the sets and costumes to then incorporate in their tours across the country. And that's a way which we can sort of join forces mm -hmm. and, uh, uh, and I think hopefully enrich the ecology as a whole. Um, the, the, um, what, what the cinema screens are is they're part of a mix. They're not, um, I, I think the word ecology is, is, is super important. That you know, what we do on the main stage in terms of bringing the great iconic pieces of the rep repertory to <coughs> life is... Uh, one thing, how we share those through cinema, how we engage wide audiences through BP Big Screens, how we stream, how we commission new work, how we work on smaller stage, how we work with uh, organisations large and small around the country. It's all part of one, one thing. It's not either or, going back to the London Regions thing. It's, it's part of how we as a national institution can use um, all of the resources that we have, uh, um, you know, cultural, artistic, physical... Um, <coughs> to the wider benefit of our opera, so that many more people can enjoy the very best of opera and ballet and have that wonderful experience when you, as I say, you go into uh, the theatre, the cinema, um, Trafalgar Square, uh, wherever it may be, and you know, two and a half hours later, you come out a slightly different person because your uh, insight in yourself has been uh, um, your insight into what it is to love, to lose, to live, has just been uh, um, uh, uh, kindled and uh, flexed by this yeah. extraordinary stuff. Let's take another question. <coughs> Lady in the orange top. To do the film projection and have a local orchestra play underneath, mm. like they do in the Albert Hall for their films. <laughs> or, or to do the, you know, have the so have the ballet or the opera 
projected, but have the soundtrack perform. You, you, you could do that, but I think that the... Actually, what people... The, uh, I think on the, on, on the cinemas, what the, the USP is to feel a sense that you are... Although you may be seeing it um, in... You know, wherever... Um, Bangor... That actually, you are well. well the, 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 if you look on the Opera House website, there's some fantastic um, tweets from people. There's one absolutely brilliant one from uh, someone in Bangor who'd seen an opera for the first time. And uh, the, the, the thing there is the sense that you are in an extension of uh, um, this shared space where everyone's coming together in the moment to have that same experience of um, you know, the wonderful orchestra of the Royal Opera House, uh, the, 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 the particular stars on stage. And I think that is that. Um, that, that's the USP of that. There are, of course, other ways of, of doing it. So, um, you know, we've had in Covent Garden um, uh, uh, an orchestra playing uh, um, alongside Casablanca, uh, the live band, and that's, that's a whole different thing. Um, there are all sorts of ways of bringing uh, lyric theatre to life now. I don't know if anyone's experienced silent opera, uh, where uh, it, it, it's a bit like a flash mob, where you go around with um, headphones in... Um, these very non-theatrical spaces and you have um, you know, a small orchestra playing in your ears and it's a brilliant, brilliant thing. There are many, many, many ways of doing it. Uh, I just think that what the cinema is brilliant at is breaking down the barriers of uh, the walls of the institution and, and the limits of 2,256 seats um, so that you know, many, many tens of thousands can share in that moment. I think um, just talking about the, the big screens, which we're, we're obviously involved with, and Alex has mentioned. It, it is a different, I mean, it's a really interesting idea, by the way, but it, it is a very, very different experience because you're there often with your kids or your, mm. your friends and your family with a picnic. Uh, in fact, one of the most memorable performances of, of any artwork I've ever seen was in uh, Duffy Park in, in Aberdeen. I think it was, it was uh, Swan Lake. It was a big screen, I don't know, about 10 years ago. And I don't know if you know Aberdeen, but there's a mist that rolls in off the North Sea and oh sort wow. of covered. And just, you know, as, as the ballet was drawing to its conclusion, this mist was literally rolling. It was like, you know, <coughs> stage, but it was completely natural. Rolling, and it was a completely different experience from the experience that yeah. people were having down in London in the, in, in the Opera House. So I think it's sometimes it's very much about the individual experience that you're getting in a different environment and all those different sort of 10 or 15 yeah. different places around the country. But it's a really interesting idea, and make sure he follows up on it. <laughs> <laughs> Can we begin to wrap up with a, with a final question to you both? There's some younger people in the audience who watch this afterwards as well, videoed, you know, you got to a great height in your careers. Are there a couple of things you would say to someone who's starting out on their career right now, sitting where you are? Well, a couple of the questioners have already raised, you know, I'm in an industry that, you know, is uh, in a, on a planet that's going through enormous change. So I, th I would say to anybody, make sure, you know, you're prepared for, for change. Um, if you join my industry, we're changing very, very quickly. Um, and it's a very, very exciting time because we're, we, you know, we're embracing and we want to be part of a, a low-carbon future. Uh, yes, at the moment, uh, the majority, not all, but the majority of our businesses are to do with natural gas and, uh, uh, and oil. Um, but we're gradually migrating to a different type of organisation. And I'm not saying it's going to happen tomorrow, but this, and the whole industry is doing the same thing. Because we, uh, as a company, are made up of 70,000 individuals who all feel like we all do about mm. the issues of the day. I mean, this idea that companies have a sort of separate sort of monolithic culture and they, you know, we're all forced to, we're not, we're, we're in this country with 16,000 people who all worry like hell about climate change. So I would say to, to anybody going into my industry or an industry like mine, just be prepared for change, be prepared to maybe leave your career in 30, 40, 50 years time doing something completely different from what you're doing now. Because most jobs, we all know the, the famous quote that most jobs that people will do in 50 years time mm. don't actually exist now. And I'm absolutely sure in my industry, most uh, I, BP's been around for 109 years. I do expect BP to be around for another 109 years, but I'm absolutely sure that people doing my job in 50 years' time will be doing something completely different. And that's exciting. So you've got to kind of 
You've got to embrace that and, and yeah. just don't assume that there's going to be a, a continuity. Alex? I agree with that in spades. I mean, although the, there's uh, been a theatre in uh, uh, Covent Garden since 1732, what, how the, what's been performed on the stage and how it's been performed and how it's been extended is, is, is just radically different. Um, I'd add to that that um, I think uh, you know, the things that... Dis what was my, my opening remarks? The things which made a difference to me personally was... Uh, when I started doing something I really believed in, uh, when I started to work incredibly hard and be very demanding of myself, and when I consistently tried to um, see where I could make a difference and really go for it. So I think those three things have, uh, have, have would be my... Uh, uh, Excellent. My so listen, uh, we've run out of time this evening. It just uh, gives me uh, time to do some plugs and some thanks. Uh, so, uh, thanks to the university, as ever, for hosting these talks through the year. They've been absolutely fascinating. We closed the hugely successful Larkin uh, exhibition at the weekend with them, and coming up very soon is an Eiffel of Rye, which is a humorous pick from the government art collection. Some absolutely amazing work uh, going in there. It opens on the 16th of October. Flood, in all its glory, is on for the rest of this week, parts two, three, and four. Uh, and lots more to come. Thank you, Peter. Thank you for BP's partnership with us this year. It's the old cliche, but it's true. We simply couldn't have done it without you, and it's been much, much more uh, than money. It's been about a real partnership with all your staff and the staff you have working in Hull. Alex, I said to you earlier on, the, the, the ballet up here was the textbook example, I think, about how national institutions should work, because in one day we had 100 young dancers working with your staff on a piece outside, uh, which they were just learnt so much through. And then, obviously, the A game you brought to opening the new theatre, plus our ability uh, to relay it to, to, to 5,000 people outside who, who stayed there, warmed <laughs> by culture in the cold wind. So, uh, thanks very much. But lastly, as ever, thank you to all you for joining us, and we'll see you next time. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.